All right, I'm back with another Media Law Chat. Today we're going to be digging into trademarks and some really interesting cases. Um, I'm here with Amanda Reed. So Amanda, go ahead, and introduce yourself and uh, tell us which cases we're going to be talking about today. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I teach at the Chapel Hill in North Carolina. I teach media law and we're going to talk today about disparaging, scandalous, and immoral trademarks. And um, the two cases are Tom versus Mattal and the Brunetti case. So All right, 2017, awesome. 2017 and 2019. So yeah, we've got two recent cases here. It's, it's kind of fun. They're sort of of the moment, and they're they're related, but play out some different issues. So so let's start out um, with the Mattel case. Give me just a teeny bit of background on the case. Sure. So you have an Asian American band that was operating under the name, the moniker, the Slants. You have Simon Tam, who was one of the uh, frontmen for the band and wanted to get a federal registration for the name of his band. And he applied for registration and the patent and trademark examiner, uh, the trademark examiner looked at the application and, um, and denied it. There are several bases on which the government can deny trademark uh, applications and the basis that in the TAM decision, he said that the term slants is disparaging to individuals of Asian descent and um, that it was gonna be denied. The band's rejoinder, the band's argument that they were using a term that they recognized could be disparaging, but they were trying to reappropriate it. They were trying to put it, um, to kind of turn it on its head. And so that they were trying to take ownership of this otherwise disparaging um, mark uh, that was not persuasive to the trademark examiner. Uh, the application was denied and TAM appeals the case and it ultimately goes up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court finds what? Oh, and an eight to zero. So it was a unanimous case. We've got everyone except Gorsuch. Gorsuch wasn't involved. And the eight to zero decision by the court was that the basis to deny a trademark application, the, the bar was unconstitutional viewpoint discrimination. So the reason the government could say no trademark for you, the Supreme Court unanimously finds was an unconstitutional violation of the First Amendment and strikes it down. Yeah, and the reasoning is interesting, right? They go through this, you know, you, well, you could say this, but not that, and this, but not that, uh, and that's where they find the viewpoint discrimination. Did you expect that answer? Did you expect that judgment? No, this was a pretty big shift because there had been First Amendment challenges to the statute um, as far back as the 80s. And the lower courts had all found that it passed a uh, constitutional review. So when the Supreme Court takes it and unanimously strikes it down, I think that that was a bit of a surprise. To the legal yeah, community. I remember a lot of people, um, you know, speculating that uh, this and the other case that we're going to talk about would lead to this sort of just mass registration of, of horrible, uh, horrible um, names and offensive uh, things that would offend people. Have we seen that? What has there been? Uh, has there been any, um, any, um, you know, mass registration of horrible names? I don't know if there's been a mass registration, but you're, you and your students are welcome to go to the uh, TESS website, uh, Trademark Electronic Search uh, Service, TESS, and put in any of their least favorite words, and you will find some pretty hateful uh, marks that have been registered. Mm -hmm. So some pretty disparaging and offensive terms that have been federally registered. Yes. Since this case or just over time? Uh, since this case. Since yes. this case. What do you think gets misunderstood about the Mattel case? Uh, well, I don't think people often understand, you know, where registration comes in in the trademark uh, schema. You can mm -hmm. use a mark. You can have common law rights without a federal registration. So federal registration basically amps up your trademark rights. It's not what gives you trademark rights. So mm -hmm. registration isn't the basis of trademark rights, it, it just merely records it and gives you greater advantages. So you get to put the little R in a circle rather than a TM or an SM. It gets you access to federal courts for uh, litigation. It can get you access to attorney's fees, treble damages, and exclusion at the border. So it makes your trademarks you know, e easier to enforce, gives you more power, but you don't have to have federal registration in order to use a mark. So I think that just some clarification of how trademark registration works in, right. in the, the big, big scheme. Yeah, so the slants 
could always be the slants. No one was telling them they couldn't have that band name. Um, and, and so, you know, you could still perform, you could have your merchandising, you could enforce the trademark, but just not as strong um, right. as if it was a re federally registered trademark. Correct. So let's move to the other case, the Brunetti yeah. case, which yeah. also is an interesting, uh, d d different. Now, I hope uh, I hope everybody is going to know that this is we, these are college students, so we're going to use the name um, in the case. Uh, unlike uh, the Supreme Court in oral arguments, trying desperately never to use the actual word. Uh, but tell us what the Brunetti case involved. All right, so you have Eric Brunetti, who was a very colorful individual, and he owned a clothing line, and he was operating under the brand name, and I'm going to spell it, because <laughs> I, it's, to the best of my understanding is how it's intended. It's F-U-C-T, which uh, would be pronounced uh, pretty much the <laughs> phonetic equivalent to what you think it would be pronounced, which is the reason <laughs> the Supreme Court did a double backflips to avoid saying it during oral argument. But he wanted to federally register. So he had been using the mark F-U-C-T since the 90s, and then wanted to seek federal registration, Mm -hmm. And when the uh, trademark examiner looked at the mark, consider, uh, considered it to be the phonetic equivalent to what you would think it would be, and said, no trademark for you on the basis that it, there's a, a bar to registration for immoral and scandalous marks. And those terms, we could probably quibble and kind of break them apart and say, are they the same? Are they different? But a lot of times trademark examiners were looking at immoral and scandalous and treating that as kind of a unitary term and said that this is a vulgar, offensive term, no trademark for you, Brunetti appeals, uh, and this is after the TAM case. So on the heels mm -hmm. of the TAM case, uh, appeals this, and then it goes up to the US Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court again finds this basis to deny a trademark unconstitutional viewpoint discrimination. So deciding what fits with moral decency, what fits with our mores, is viewpoint discrimination and the supreme court said that that is anathema to first amendment it violates uh core first amendment principles and is struck down as unconstitutional yeah and just fascinating right so so you mentioned colorful individual certainly oh. um so these you know t-shirts hats were one of the big issues right that his hats were very popular that had f-u-c-t um on them um again surprising decision to you after the tam decision no yeah. after the tam decision this uh was the, the, the handwriting was, was pretty clear on the wall. Uh, the Supreme Court alluded to it in the TAM decision, uh, but didn't go as far as to decide immoral and scandalous at the time it was deciding disparaging, giving the Solicitor uh, General an opportunity to brief it in case there was some distinguishing feature between it. But after the, the eight to zero pretty strong message coming out of the TAM case, uh, the Brunetti case was, was, was pretty clear. The handwriting was pretty clear. And so again, lots of predictions about now we're going to be seeing clothing with um, all sorts of offensive language on it. Um, so, so we need to go look up these marks and see what's what's in there. Is there any is there any recourse for someone who who does find these things to be offensive? Under First Amendment jurisprudence, if you're offended, avert your gaze. Yeah, and that's core First Amendment principles that giving offense is a viewpoint and you can't stop people from being offensive. The First Amendment protects your right to be offensive. Do you see any, do you see us going in any different direction on that front? You know, these are two, these are two recent cases and they seem to just cement this line um, that's just been drawn harder and bolder and harder and bolder. Uh, and, you know, some people really object to that. They think that why in the world should we have, be forced to see these kinds of, you know, hats with F-U-C-T F -U -C -T, um, as we're walking down the street. But I don't see us changing course at all. If anything, just continuing even more firmly in the course that's been, that's been charted. I, I think we're moving uh, more, uh, yes, more directly. Um, and if people object to it, this is where the marketplace of ideas gets turned into a literal marketplace and don't buy it. Uh, mm -hmm. I think is going to be the First Amendment rejoinder to if you're offended, avoid it, avert your gaze, don't, don't, uh, don't engage. Um, 
some interesting things that I've noticed with this is how the First Amendment is being used in kind of a deregulatory way that using um, First Amendment scrutiny over you know, this commercial activity, this commercial speech is, um, is kind of in line with where the First Amendment jurisprudence has been going in the past, oh, 50 years or so. So it's giving more intense scrutiny to commercial speech and it's getting harder for the government to regulate commercial speech. We see that in the Sorrell case. We see it in the Lorillard case. It, it's just harder for the government to justify um, its regulation of commercial speech. And Central Hudson, I mean, Central Hudson it isn't looking that different from strict scrutiny, the way that it's kind of ratcheting up uh, the regulation of commercial speech. Yeah, you know, that was something that was really interesting to me about Mattel versus Tam versus the Brunetti case. Um, and that is like with the with the Tam case, I mean, he, he essentially was making a political speech argument, right? So, so you know, it's trademarks, it's, you know, related to commercial speech, but he was saying, I'm trying to flip this offensive term on its face. I'm trying to fight back against racism. Whereas the Brunetti case was just, I am selling offensive merchandise to make money and nobody can get in my way. Um, it just seems to be to be a line that people don't quite suss out like they, you know I found I found it much easier to think about viewpoint discrimination when I was thinking about something that was fairly political in nature um, or related to social issues as opposed to Brunetti it was just it was just commerce it was just shirts and hats you, you make a good point, um, but I think the response would be that Tam could continue to use that mark and make the political message without the federal government standing behind it. Yeah. One of the big open questions that the Brunetti case and the Tam case have not answered is which speech category do we put trademarks in? Are trademarks commercial speech? Are they kind of like a government program? Is it a limited public forum? And which bucket we put speech in has implications on how we treat it. And the court has not clarified what are trademarks. And the lower courts grappled with it so that there was some record. The court could have taken that on and clarified that, but there was, clearly wasn't enough consensus behind answering what bucket do we put trademarks in. And so that's really an open question after the TAM and Mattal case. So there are some very clear things like viewpoint discrimination is not tolerated in any way, but then some other open questions are what are trademarks? What bucket do we put those in? Because yeah. Is it the government? Because when the government stands behind it, when you get to put the R in the circle, when it puts, you know, the power giving you access to federal courts, giving you access to border exclusion, giving you access to attorney's fees, like so that there are goodies that come along with federal registration and the government in some ways stands behind those marks. What exactly are trademarks? What, are, what is it when they get registered? But the court hasn't seemed at all open to the idea that this is compelling government to speak, that, you know, that that signing on with that mark is forcing the government to um, to support speech that it does not support, which, you know, that's been an interesting thread in some other cases, but clearly didn't pop up here at all or didn't didn't carry the day. It did not carry the day. And it was argued in the TAM case initially was one of the arguments was that this is government speech. And um, Alito, speaking for the majority, really walks that back and says, no, just because you register something, it doesn't automatically convert it into government speech, because that would really open up and throw wide open the government speech doctrine, which mm -hmm. the court definitely did not seem keen to do. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been so fascinating. Two, two terrific cases, recent cases um, that really show us where we're going and and show us that the that the court is united, you know, with all of the other one vote decisions that we're seeing, we are in the First Amendment realms still seeing these strange coalitions <laughs> that come together and a pretty a pretty united court on these issues. First Amendment makes strange bedfellows, and I also find that intellectual property cases make for strange uh, <laughs> bedfellows. They don't fall cleanly upon other normal ideological lines. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for being with us. I really appreciate you doing this and, uh, and have a great rest of your semester. Thank you. It's my All pleasure. Bye-bye. Right.